uh, welcome everyone. My name is Dinesh Srani and uh, I'm a software engineer at Portworks. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about how you can use external persistent volumes to achieve high availability and reduce recovery times when using stateful services on DCUS. So um, let's jump right in. Uh, here are topics that uh, I'm going to be going to cover. I'm going to cover today. Uh, we'll talk about the different kinds of stateful services. Then I'll go through the advantages of using external persistent volumes. Um, I'll also give you an introduction about Portworx and how you can deploy services on DCUS to take advantage of Portworx volumes. Uh, then I'll do a demo showing how you can install Portworx and uh, Cassandra to use Portworx volumes and basically demonstrate failover and some other useful scenarios. So uh, let's talk about stateful services. Uh, so there are basically two types of stateful services when it comes to persisting data. The first are simple applications which don't do their own replication. Uh, they basically rely on the underneath storage layer to be always available. So in cases of failures, you would uh, the storage layer would basically make the same voluble volume available on another node so that the application can come up with the same state. Um, the second type is where applications do their own replication across nodes. So in case a node dies or fails, there is always another copy of the data on the cluster. So if the, data that, if the node that had crashed does come online, then the replication takes care of basically uh, repairing data back onto that node that it had missed. Now this uh, replication or re-replication or repair can either be manually triggered or it uh, can be automatic depending on the application. So uh, some of the examples for the first type of application are basically WordPress or MySQL, which run in simple mode and don't do their own replication. Uh, whereas for the second type, uh, it would be Cassandra or HDFS, which basically do replication across nodes and then uh, do repairs in case of failures. So uh, now you might, you might be asking, why is this replication strategy important? Well, it's because bad things happen all the time, right? Your nodes could crash, your network could have issues. For example, your network could get partitioned, so none of your nodes are in quorum. Your disk could go, go down, or your nodes could go down. Your, bring, uh, your entire rack could go down, bringing down multiple nodes. Uh, for applications that do their own replication, there is always another copy on one of the other nodes in the cluster. So you can still continue to serve IOs, and your application will not be affected by the downtime uh, by, by one node being down. Uh, and if you have to replace a node, you can just bootstrap it and repair all the necessary data to it. Um, this does end up taking a lot of time sometimes, uh, depending on how much data you had on the node that did go down. And in that, in that time that you're repairing data to that node, uh, you would, uh, your throughput for uh, I.O. From that, for that service would basically drop. Uh, for instance, if you had a Cassandra cluster that was doing replication, uh, uh, a three-way replication, and one of your nodes goes down, you would then only be able to serve I, uh, reads from two of the nodes instead of uh, being able to serve from three of the nodes. And uh, while the repair is going down, you would also, uh, your network would also take a hit because all the data would need to be transferred from the two nodes back to the one node that is being bought up. Uh, for non-clustered applications, though, if you had no backup and um, were using local storage, your application would be doomed uh, because you would not be able to bring it back up until you can either move your data from the nodes, uh, data disk from the nodes that went down. And uh, in case your data nodes actually had corruption, uh, had physical corruption, then then your uh, you will basically end up losing your data. So. How can external persistent storage help in all of this? Well, for the ca case of applications like MySQL and WordPress, which don't do their own replication, it can help to provide high availability for your services. And uh, it, it basically makes sure that your downtime is eliminated. And uh, for services that do do their own replication, it can help reduce recovery times by a large amount. Because what will end up happening is you will not have to have to bootstrap data back to your new node. All you would have to do is basically uh, repair data for the time that you uh, that for the time that the node was down before it came back on another node. 
I'll talk a little uh, bit more about this uh, in the next slides. Um, another advantage of using external storage providers like Portworx is that uh, it, it helps you virtualize your storage, so you can grow your uh, you can basically grow your compute and power uh, and storage needs uh, independently of each other. Okay, uh, so before we talk uh, about the scenarios, I just wanted to give a brief introduction about Portworx because a lot of the scenarios that we talk about depend on a software so storage solution like Portworx already installed on your uh, cluster. So uh, Portworx is the first production-ready software-defined storage designed for the from the ground up for microservices in mind. So using Portworx, you can provision and manage container granular virtual devices. And uh, tight integration with schedulers and container orchestrators basically help run your workload local to where the storage is, is provisioned. Um, apart from this, we also have a couple of other uh, useful features that help manage your uh, storage, uh, daily, daily needs for storage. So you can basically take uh, copy on write snapshots, which can be restored from in case you have any outage or any issue with uh, the services that are using your volumes. You can also take uh, you can also take something called cloud snaps, which will basically back up your entire volumes into any object store uh, outside your cluster. So uh, basically, that object store can be any S3 compliant object store, your Azure Blob storage, or uh, Google Google Cloud storage. Uh, we also allow uh, encryption of volumes on either a cluster level, so you can you can have one cluster wide encryption key. Or you can have uh, you can have encryption keys on a per volume basis. So this is very helpful in cases where you have multi tenants and you don't want uh, you don't want to share uh, encryption keys between uh, different volumes and different services. Um, another feature um, of uh, uh, Portwax is that uh, everything is basically API driven. So uh, everything can basically be automated. You don't have to manually go in and either provision volumes or manage your data. Uh, you can do. You can basically. Uh, this is written for uh, DevOps from the ground up. So everything is basically automatable, and you would never have to actually go in and manually do any kind of uh, repair or recovery. Um, and we actually run as a container ourselves, so it makes it very easy to deploy and maintain. Um, and uh, you must have heard about CSI in the past couple of days. And as soon as the schedule orchestrators uh, have support for CSI, uh, Portworx will also have, su uh, have support. So uh, this is how basically uh, Portworx would look once it's deployed. So uh, Portworx would basically scan all the block devices, whether it is your direct attached storage, storage devices, or an EBS volume, or Azure managed disks. disks and carve them out into one big clustered storage pool. And when your pods or your containers are spinning up, they would basically go ahead and uh, request for thinly provisioned volumes uh, from this cluster storage pool. And we would basically uh, replicate data for these volumes across nodes so that uh, in case one of your nodes goes down, you're still able to bring up the container on another node with the same state. So here, basically, uh, the orange part is what Portworx would comprise of. And you would basically run different apps which would, uh, which would uh, request for volumes from Portworx. So I talked about block-level replication. Uh, this is how, basically, it would work. So uh, all, all, all writes would basically be synchronously replicated across, the replica, uh, across uh, multiple nodes. Uh, and these replicas are actually accessible not just from the nodes where the data lies, but from any node where Portworx is installed. So in case you, uh, you want to scale your cluster where you have a few uh, nodes which have more compute and memory uh, and uh, have separate nodes which have more storage, you can always, have, uh, you can always start up Portworx as storage-less nodes to consume storage from, uh, from the nodes which have more storage available. Um, and in this case, what would happen is basically all uh, all uh, all all writes would basically be uh, synchronously replicated onto other nodes. And if a node goes down, uh, basically you would be able you would still be able to use another replica uh, from another node. And uh, when the node that had gone gone down basically comes back up, Portworx in the background would uh, repair the data to bring that uh, replica back up to state uh, with the current state of the volume. 
And uh, if that node goes down permanently, what Portworx would do is basically we would uh, re-replicate that data onto an other node so that you always have the minimum uh, replication uh, that you had specified for your volume. So um, now let's talk about the recovery times with local volumes and external persistent vol volumes. Um, uh, this, is, this is mostly talking about the second uh, type of applications where, uh, where uh, applications do their own uh, replication. Now, uh, when tasks use, the, use local storage, they are basically pinned to that node. So uh, with local volumes, uh, if a node uh, crashes, uh, the faster that the node comes back up online is better because then you have less amount of data to repair. But but in reality, that is not always the case. Nodes sometimes could uh, you you could take down nodes for maintenance cycles, and in that case, your 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 time period that the node is down could be large. So you will end up uh, having to repair a large amount of data. Um, and and. And nodes do take up some time to come back up in case they had crashed. So that just extends the cycle, uh, extends the time that uh, that you would have to repair data for. But in case that the node fails permanently, uh, this this repair time can be even longer because uh, you would basically have to re-replicate all your data from uh, from one of the other replicas in the cluster back to that node. And this could end up taking a lot of time. It could range from anywhere between hours to days. Um, and while this is happening, uh, like I had mentioned before, the throughput of your service will be affected, and also uh, you would you would end up spending a lot of uh, you would end up spending you would end up sp uh, using a lot of network throughput just to re uh, repair uh, data on back onto that node. And this can actually bring down your entire uh, service uh, if, if you basically end up using a lot of throughput just to do the repairs. Now uh, let's, look at, uh, let's take a look at the recovery times with, uh, with external storage. So with external uh, volumes, basically your, uh, your data is accessible from any node in the cluster. So if a node does go down, you don't wait. You don't have to wait for it to come back up to basically uh, uh, to uh, to use your uh, to bring your service back up. Uh, all 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 that would need to happen is your scheduler would need to uh, schedule that service onto another node and ask for it to use the same volume, and it would come back to its same state. And all you would have to do is basically repair data for the time that it took for the scheduler to reschedule your uh, reschedule your uh, your pod onto another node. And um, this is actually similar in case a node uh, dies permanently too. Because uh, since there is always another replica available on, on the cluster, you would just need uh, to wait for the scheduler to schedule your uh, container onto another node. And it would uh, again, you would just need to repair the data back onto that node for the time that the node was down. OK, so. Uh, so, so here are some of the advantages of using uh, Portworx or any uh, software-defined storage, uh, as like Portworx uh, for your for, uh, for your solution. Uh, basically, using a SAN or a NAS is an anti-pattern in uh, microservices, because uh, it, it, by using a SAN or a NAS, you end up losing the flexibility that you have for from microservices, because you're basically siloing your uh, storage. From out uh, into uh, into a storage array that's outside your current uh, uh, cluster. Um, this also introduces latencies because uh, for e for all the data that is to be written to your storage array, it needs to basically traverse uh, traverse from your compute cluster to your storage cluster. And it is also actually a one point of failure. So in case you lose that link between your compute cluster and your storage cluster, all your stateful services will go down at that point. Uh, and and actually having uh, having an external storage provide pro, uh, having an external storage array uh, increases uh, increases complexities and failures when you're dealing with uh, dealing with node crashes and other uh, other uh, uh, scenarios that might happen in your uh, cluster. So uh, like I mentioned, Portbox is built for uh, microservices from the ground up. And uh, one of the things that we do is that we have tight integration with schedulers. So we can actually uh, influence schedulers 
to co-locate your tasks with uh, where the data is located instead of uh, basically uh, having it located anywhere and uh, so we don't shard data across multiple uh, across all the nodes we make it so that uh, containers can take advantage of having data local to your to the node where they are scheduled uh, another advantage is uh, that uh, there is a common uh, solution for uh, hybrid deployments. So uh, there are a lot of scenarios um, nowadays where uh, companies have have uh, hybrid deployments where, where they have an on-prem uh, cluster, but they want to basically burst into the cloud. Now, if you were not using a software-defined storage solution like Portworx, you would basically need to have automation and tools that were different for both your on-prem and cloud solutions. Uh, by having one unified layer of ma uh, of managing your storage, you can eliminate that and uh, build your apps faster rather than having to worry about uh, managing your storage on different uh, deployments. Okay, so uh, now you might ask, why not just use EBS directly? So like I pointed out, first of all, EBS will work only on... Uh, only on AWS. Same thing with uh, other, uh, uh, like Azure Managed Disk or Google Cloud Storage. So you would basically need to have different automation and tools for for your uh, for your multi uh, for your hybrid uh, deployments. Um, also, solution also EBS has a limit of 16 uh, volumes that you can attach to any EC in, EC2 instance. So in case you have uh, EC2 in, beefy EC2 instances and you want to work a lot of uh, containers on that, you will end up hitting a limit. So you will not be able to tightly pack your services onto a node in that case. Uh, one of the uh, most uh, common uh, scenarios that you would run into with EBS is actually when you're testing failover scenarios, you will see a lot of the time EBS volumes would get stuck in attaching or detaching state. Uh, this is this is again uh, this is problematic if you want to basically automate your entire environment because somebody will have to manually go in and then uh, detach your volume or attach it to the new node. And in fact, I was just talking to somebody earlier uh, earlier this week, and they mentioned that um, one of their volumes got stuck in a detaching state because they were using a volume plugin, and there was no way out of it. The only thing that they could basically do was delete the EPS volumes, and that is. Uh, that is a data loss situation that you don't want to get into in production. Um, another thing with EBS is uh, the performance is not always up to mark. So you can always pay for provision diops, but at that point uh, you will end up spending a lot of lot more money. Uh, and the last thing is failover is slow. So EBS wasn't designed for the microservices in mind. So it, it wasn't uh, designed for scenarios where you would basically be failing over your containers or, or services very often. So it, it ends up taking a lot of time to fail over your uh, EBS volumes from, from one node to another. So, so there's nothing wrong with using EBS as such. I mean, uh, the only thing is you don't want to be using EBS volumes directly with your containers. You want to have a layer on top of EBS which does the uh, management of your container granular volumes so that you can easily fail over your containers instead of uh, having to uh, depend on EBS doing the, the move for your volumes. So um, how can you use Portwox with your stateful services? So uh, th there, are, there are three ways that you can do this right now. So the first way is uh, you can deploy simple services in Marathon um, using, uh, using uh, Portwox as the volume driver. Uh, and any applications in the DCUS universe which allow you to configure an external uh, volume provider, you can basically uh, specify Portwox as, as the driver. Uh, the second uh, way is uh, you can basically deploy services that we've de developed based on DCUS commons, which are also available in the universe. Uh, I'll go through these um, in detail later. Um, and we also have the DCUS commons framework, which we've modified to be able to you know, be able to use Portwox volumes. Uh, so you can always use that to develop your own services too. All right, so uh, this is an example of how you can use Marathon to uh, use Portwox uh, volumes. This is a simple example of a MySQL container that you would spin up. All you would have to do is in the parameters for your, uh, in the parameters for your doc, for your container, you would basically need to specify the volume driver as Portwox. 
and um, in the in the volume uh, parameter, you would you would be able to specify the size for the volume, the replication factor, uh, the name for the volume, as well as any other parameters that you want to use while creating the volume. Um, and you don't need to pre-provision volumes at all in this case. Uh, all of this would be dynamically done. So as soon as you launch this, um, DC, uh, Mesos would basically try to spin up a Docker container. Uh, we would get a request to uh, basically mount this volume. We would see that this volume has not been created. These options would then get passed to us, and we would dynamically create these volumes and mount it inside your container. And uh, you can basically use a similar type of um, uh, similar spec to uh, to use with Docker as well as UCR. So um, about the DCOS Commons uh, based uh, services that I was talking about, so we basically modified uh, enhanced the DCOS Commons framework to work, work with Portworx volumes. And uh, there are basically four services that are available uh, through DCOS Commons, and you can obviously write more. But the four, ones, four uh, services that are available are uh, Cassandra, Hadoop, Elasticsearch, and Kafka. And we've actually added support for Portworx volumes and submitted these to the Unos. So all you have to do is um, go to the Unos and search for Portworx, and you would be able to install these four uh, services with Portworx volumes uh, backing the state. Uh, so we've actually uh, made a couple of more enhancements where we've uh, we've allowed for the task to uh, fail over between nodes because uh, there is there is nothing that's pinning the tasks to a particular node now since there is Portworx or uh, backing uh, backing these services. So uh, this basically means that uh, your your services will have a higher uptime as well as your re your recovery times will be reduced by a large margin. Uh, we've also made changes to the framework so that your volumes are co-located with your tasks. So this reduces latencies as, as well as uh, uh, network, uh, network usage. So um, this is an example of a Hello World program. Uh, this is basically available in DCOS Commons. And we've uh, the parts that I've highlighted is basically what all you would need to ch uh, change to use Portworx volumes instead of the default uh, root and uh, mount volumes. So DCOS Commons is actually a great way to write stateful services. Uh, the only thing is right now, before they add uh, support for CSI, they only support uh, root and mount disks, disks, which basically means that your services are pinned to a particular node. So in case that node goes down, that task is not going to spin up on another node because that data is available only on the node that went down. So we've, uh, like I mentioned, we've basically modified it to support Portworx volumes. And all you have to do is basically uh, change the type of the volume from root amount to Docker, uh, then specify the Docker volume driver as PXD, uh, the Docker volume name, which is the one name for the volume. So over there, you can also specify the size of the, uh, not the size, uh, the si use size is a different parameter, but you can specify the replication factor you want to use as well as if you want to encrypt volumes and any other parameters that you would be able to pass to Portworx. So basically, you can specify any uh, service as a spec like this and, uh, and specify uh, Docker volume drivers and Portworx to, to take advantage of Portworx. Uh, and all of this, again, volumes are all dynamically provisioned, so you don't have to go out of band or talk to your storage provider to provision volumes. All of this will be taken automatically when the service first comes up. So the source code for this is available at uh, github.com slash portworks slash DCOS commons in case you want to take a look. All right, uh, demo time. So what I'm going to show you is um, basically, I'm going to install Portworx on DCOS. I'm going to show you how easy it is to install DCOS. And then uh, I'm going to install Cassandra and go through a few scenarios to basically show, um, go through a couple of scenarios that you, you could encounter in, uh, in, in your production. What's happening? 
let me just open it up again sorry Yeah, so uh, basically Portworks as well as all the other services I specified are available in the universe. So all you have to do is go and search for Portworks. Uh, we're going to select Portworks uh, service and uh, so we have a six node cluster which is basically five private nodes and one public agent and we're going to install Portworks on the five private agents. Uh, we're going to specify the uh, management and data interface that we want to use and just click review and deploy. And what this is going to end up doing is it's going to spin up an etcd cluster, and then it's going to spin up. Uh, so we use etcd to st store our uh, control plane uh, state. So um, it's it's all going to spin that up. It's going to spin up InfluxDB, which we use to store statistics. It's also going to also going to spin up uh, Lighthouse, which is our UI. And finally, it's going to install Portworks on all the five uh, private agents. So I sp sped up the video a little because it ends up taking around. Uh, five, six minutes to install. But as you can see, um, the etcd cluster got, inst uh, got installed, then the proxy got installed, InfluxDB got installed, and Lighthouse got installed. So basically what's happening now is the Portworks, uh, Portworks is basically getting installed on all the nodes. And if you go to complete it, you'll see there are five tasks for the Portworks install that finished. So um, basically what I'm doing now is I'm, I have uh, assessed into one of the private agents and I'm just going to watch uh, for, for the status for, uh, from Pixie Cuddle, which is our uh, CLI, and wait for all the nodes to come up. So as you can see, three nodes have come up. And um, I have... Uh, I have purposely not attached a disk to one of the nodes. So you can see that all of these automatically get provisioned, uh, get added to a cluster as either a storage node or a storage less node, depending on if there were block devices attached to that node or not. So uh, I'm gonna just going to pause it here for a second. And then uh, basically, uh, the cluster is up now. And as you can see, we have five nodes in the cluster. Four, four of these nodes have 400 GB uh, disks attached to them, whereas one of them is basically a storage less uh, node. So now that the Portworks cluster is up, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and spin up uh, a, a three-node Cassandra cluster on top of this. And uh, so again, the Cassandra Portworks uh, service is available in the universe. I'm just going to show you that there are no volumes created initially. So you just need to run Pixie Cuddle volume list, and uh, you can see there are no volumes. So uh, now we are going to go back into the catalog and search for the Portworks Cassandra service. And we don't really have to change anything, but by default, the options are not specified because it depends on what you want to uh, provision it as. But we are going to go ahead and specify that we want a uh, Portworks cluster with a replication factor of 3. And this is basically going to create uh, uh, 3 10 GB volumes and attach them to each one of the Cassandra nodes. So we just have to click Review, Deploy, and then Deploy. And uh, we're going to look at the state of the service. Again, I've sped it up a little because it takes time for Cassandra just to spin up to pull the artifacts. But um, as you saw, one of the nodes has spun up, and it automatically provisioned a 10 GB volume with a replication factor of 3 and attached it to a node uh, uh, whose IP ends with 151, which we'll see from the DCOS UI is where the, uh, DC, uh, the node had, uh, Cassandra node had spun up. Um, so the second node comes up, and then the third node comes up. So at this point, all three no all three volumes will be provisioned. Um, we'll just take a look, just do a volume list again, and we see that all three uh, all three volumes have been created with a replication factor of three. So all we had needed to do was specify the base name for the volume, and then for node zero, it basically created Cassandra zero, Cassandra one, and then Cassandra two. So uh, now that the cluster is up. One of the scenarios that I was talking about was what happens if your node fails. So if you didn't have something like uh, Portworks running, uh, providing storage to your Cassandra cluster, the framework would basically keep retrying, waiting for that node to come back up. And it would not start it on another node, unless you manually went in and said that you want to replace a node. 
Now, if you replaced a node, you would basically need to run a bootstrap and a repair command again, which could be expensive. What's going to happen here is, since we have replicated the data across nodes, as soon as we kill the node, so I'm just going to go ahead and kill one of the nodes where, uh, where the task is running. I'm just going to power it off. What we're going to see is that uh, the framework is going to realize that there's nothing for this task that is pinning it to that node. And uh, as you can see, DCO has already uh, figures out that the node is um, offline. And the framework is also going to realize that the node, node has gone offline. There's nothing. Uh, all it requires from uh, a node uh, is our CPU memory and disk and data that is not really pinned to a node. So it's going to basically go ahead and spin up that same uh, Cassandra node onto another node, which was node eight, uh, ending with uh, one 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 three one, which is uh, a three. So I'm just going to go back into A3, and um, we'll just run pixie curl volume list, which will show us that the volume has now been attached onto this node. Oh, yeah. If you check status, that's the node that we actually took down. And if you do a volume list, you'll see that Cassandra 2, that's the, that's the task that we had killed, basically comes up on, uh, on uh, is basically attached to the new node right now. Now, uh, one more thing you must have noticed is that I actually just allocated 10 GB of uh, data to each one of these nodes. Now, if you're running in a production cluster and you spun up this spun up this cluster and gave it to your uh, give it uh, to to uh, give it to the production guys to use, you would soon realize that this is not enough. Now, if you were using if you were not using something like uh, Portworx underneath, what would need to happen is you would need to spin up an entire new cluster sp uh, and allocate it more space. But with Portwax, uh, all you really need to do is, so I, I'm just uh, showing the output of DF over here. Uh, and you, you can see that uh, the volume uh, which is mounted under Valib OSD mounts Cassandra 0 has a size of uh, 9.8 GB, roughly 10 GB. Um, so what we are going to do here is we can dy actually dynamically resize this volume. So you, so that you don't really need to take your application or service uh, offline. All you need to do is run one uh, simple command, and it will automatically uh, resize your volume. Um, so all these commands that I'm showing, uh, I'm using uh, the CLI just uh, to make it clear. But all of these are actually uh, using the same uh, REST, uh, REST API interface that you can uh, automate against. So basically, you can check status. You can dynamically list your, you can list your volumes. You can even provision your volumes. You can, and you, uh, even if you want to update the size of your volumes, all of that is, uh, can be driven through APIs. So at this point, all, a, all uh, an admin or a DevOps uh, person would need to do is uh, run a command or use the REST API to basically update the volume's size. So uh, I'm just going to basically update the size to, to 100 GB. And this just takes a few seconds. And uh, if I check DF-S, you'll see that uh, this volume is now a 100 GB volume. And this will basically be uh, available to your, to your application right away. So you don't have to take it down or do any kind of maintenance for this. All right, so that's the end of the presentation. Um, any questions? Uh, so we're actually evaluating Portworx to be production ready inside our company. And we hit uh, like a chicken egg problem. Uh, it is the following. So we're using DCOS Marathon PXD driver, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we wrote some disaster recovery tests, so basically killing the node and checking the if not uh, successfully rejoin the cluster. Mm -hmm. uh, what actually happens is that uh, Docker D, after reboot, is getting stuck for 15, 12 minutes, uh, uh, actively logging that PXD driver is inaccessible. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Uh, after some internal timeout, it proceeds and then picks it up. And the reason for that is that the P, uh, part works itself is inside container, right? So it's yeah. really chicken neck. Yes. So uh, what would you suggest to work around the problem? Um, yes. So we have encountered that problem. That is uh, actually a limitation with uh, Docker. The way the Docker works is every time it uh, starts up, it queries for all the volumes that it knew, and it basically tries to uh, talk to the plugin to figure out what the state of the volume is. Um, so uh, th the way we've uh, we worked around this is we're basically uh, applying to roll out uh, Portworks where you would install it as a, a run C container instead of deploying it as a port as a Docker container. So there would be no dependency between Docker and Portworks in that case. So what would happen is you would kill Docker, but Portworks would still be up and running, and Docker would basically go ahead and query Portworks for all the uh, the volumes, and it would uh, it would not block at that point. All right. Um, any other questions? Um, so, with the block level replication, what kind of speed hit would we be seeing with Portworks? Because it's having to send it out, but what kind of performance would we be looking at to replicate a block layer, like three replicas? Um, so anything greater than one replica, there will be a slight performance hit because obviously it's going, uh, uh, it's you're you're sending uh, packets across the network, uh, and what we've seen is the the hit is any uh, between three and five percent. So uh, th th there is a small hit, but at that cost, you're basically getting an added advantage of uh, getting high availability and all the other features that the storage layer provides uh, in this case. All right, any other questions? Hi, thank you for uh, the presentation. I just, I'm just trying to get familiar with some of the concepts that you introduced. Uh, I, for example, wasn't aware of some of the components I saw in the list ETCD, and I started wondering about uh, data persistence and, uh, and, and what is actually needed by Portworks to operate. And what would happen if we lost for example, ETCD? Uh, good question. So um, the way it is in the universe, uh, we made it very simple for somebody to just install and uh, try out Portworks. For production, though, we suggest that you install etcd uh, independent of Mesos or DCOS. Because uh, what can what will happen in uh, that case is in case your DCOS or in case you have to reinstall Mesos or DCOS, your Portworks installation will not be affected at all. So in this case, if DCO, if you had to re reinstall Mesos or DCOS, since HCD is using local volumes, you will not get back the same offers, and you will not be able to bring back HCD with the same uh, state. So in production, we actually suggest you have an external HCD apart from this. But uh, the the point over here is to demonstrate how easy it is, and in case somebody just wants to try it out really quickly. And HCD is just used to store, uh, actually just used to store the uh, metadata for our control plane. There's no actual data stored over there. So it, it basically st uh, sh uh, stores information on what volumes have been provisioned and uh, all that such. And we are actually working on a way that in case you do lose your HCD, you will still be able to reconstruct HCD by looking at data across, you, by looking at all the block devices that you have in your cluster and basically reconstruct that. So we are working towards having that, yeah. I saw you that uh, you have to launch another framework different from the Mesos framework in order to, to launch Cassandra. I assume with Portbox. Mm -hmm. I assume it's the same with uh, uh, HDFS. Uh, yeah, so so all these frameworks are based on DCOS Commons, which uh, has a uh, so basically DCOS Commons has uh, uh, is is an SDK to uh, st uh, launch and manage your stateful services. Uh, the only thing over there is that they had support for local uh, root and mount disks. So we've we've only modified that framework to be able to support Portbox volumes. So uh, and we've just rebuilt. The uh, we've uh, we've changed the parameters that you pass into the YAML spec so that they can use the Portworks volumes. So uh, it's it's basically one SDK, and we've built these four services on top of that SDK. Okay, so 
I think I, you answered my question, but yes. all the functionality that that's added to this framework is uh, still in your in your framework, isn't it? Like Kerberos for HDFS or TLS yes. for Cassandra. Yes, all that support that's there in the base DCS commons is also in this. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yep. All right. Um, any other questions? All right. Uh, so you can always visit us at uh, at our booth if you have any more questions. You can always go to our website too. Um, like I mentioned, all our services are in the uh, catalog, so you can always just search for Portworks and uh, download and install them. Uh, you can also visit our docs website if you want to get started. We have a free PX developer version. We also have a PX enterprise version that's free, which, which is which has all the features enabled and is free to try for 30 days. Um, you can contact us at info at portworks.com for more information. All right. Thank you.